but again, it's good to see y'all. Um, it is amazing how many kids are in this dang church. Like when you, <laughs> when, they, when they clear out, it's like half the room. Um, so um, I want to invite you, if you're able, to stand up with me. And we are going to recite the Lord's Prayer together. Uh, it should be up here. There it is. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Right, you can be seated. We're doing like a two-week mini-series called Life is Liturgy. And um, get to that here in a second. But <clears throat> a very long time ago, right, we talked about this. All good stories start with once upon a time or a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> But a very long time ago, when I went on, first went on staff with this church, that was 20 years ago, uh, this month actually, a good friend of mine told me a very important lesson, and I've shared, that, shared it here on Sundays before, but it, it has stuck with me, and he said this, he said that so much of our lives, um, there are these two sides that must be done. There is, uh, there's God's part, then there's our part. There are the things that God does that only God can do, and we, uh, he has to be the one to do those things. And then there are the things that are our part, the, the ways that we respond to him, um, the ways that we respond to what he's doing or what he wants to do in our lives, the things that he calls us into, the things that God invites us into. So these two sides, God's part and our part. Each of us, each of you, have things in our lives that we need to allow God to do that we cannot do for ourselves. You, you, you can't do it. It's not your job. It's God's part. There's a very long list of those things, and I'm, I can't list them out for you. It's like all the examples, but, but there are things that we can only allow God to do in our lives. There are also things that God doesn't do that must come from us. It is a response that we have to him, to the things that he's doing, again, to the things that he is wanting to do in our midst. At times, that's for you as an individual, for me as an individual, for us as people, like ourselves. And then there's the y'all part, right? There's the, the, the you all, the you guys, uh, depending on where you're from. Um, you know, there's the... They're the things collectively for us to respond to as a church, as a body. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, uh, one example would be uh, this idea of atonement. Well, that's kind of like a big word. I get it. And there's a whole lot that goes up into this. But, but there's this question of, like, what does it mean for us to be made right? What does it mean for us to be made new again, to be reconciled to, back to God how, how, how is it that we can truly be made new? And as I'm in, kind of introducing this idea of life as liturgy, I want to take a moment here this morning and read from Hebrews chapter 10. Um, it'll be up here. I'm giving you a heads up now. I'm going to read a little bit of this chapter, okay? A lot of it. It's like more than probably what you're normal, what you're used to, but... And there's so much background that happens in Hebrews. Like there's this, there's this long and really a beautiful explanation of what uh, the work of God is. Like how, how is it that, that, that we understand who God is and what he's doing? What is the vision that he has for our lives? What does it mean for us to be made new and to walk with him? And there's a lot of like um, history that is wrapped up into this for the Jewish culture. Uh, and, and, and it is a... Hebrews is a very beautiful book, um, and I recognize that we are just kind of like parachuting and dropping down right in the middle of it. So I, can, I recognize that. But I want to pick up here in chapter 10. It says, The law, 
is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would have, um, they would have stopped being offered. For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This is a big deal for the author of Hebrews to write this. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, he's kind of explaining what he just wrote here. He said, first he said, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance with the law. So they were doing what they were instructed to do, right? Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. will." He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let's just pause here for a second. Doesn't this sound like good news, right? Like this just sounds... Wonderful! Like, there's not a requirement to make these annual sacrifices. Um, it's, it's not necessary. Jesus came, and he took care of that. He did one sacrifice, uh, and that covered our sins. Uh, we have someone who has taken all the bad things we've done, the things that we're currently doing, the things that we will ever do, all of that, these things that would ca- they, they cause a rift in our relationship with God. And he's taken them upon himself so that we can have a right relationship with God. Again, this is good news. Let's keep reading. There's more good to follow. Verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he's talking about Jesus, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. This is like a refrain, right, uh, uh, that is being said again. Like, uh, Jesus has done the work. This is good news. So Jesus is this priest who has made this one-time sacrifice and caused us to be forgiving. Again, it sounds like It's all said and done, right? I mean, it's good. This is good news. Let's pick up in verse 19 because uh, there's like a shifting gears here a little bit about, well, now what? What does this mean for us? Verse 19, therefore, and we've talked about the therefore, right? What's the therefore, therefore? We just read that. Why the therefore is there? It's always a good question to ask when there's a therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? All right, therefore, Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, the most holy place, this is like the internal part of the temple. This is the place that only the priest could go. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, This is where it gets important for us. Verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
So we have a part there. We draw near to God. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So when we read through this, we see that there is this, in the, kind of in that first half, there's God's part. There's the things that he has done, the things that he is doing. And, and I, we see that Jesus is this, this one-time sacrifice that, that washes away our sins and it puts us back in right, right relationship with God the Father. That is a good thing. And, and, and he's, the, the author writes that we are being uh, made holy. So that we recognize that even then there's this process, there's this thing that is happening. There's this maturity, this growth, this, this thing that God is doing in you still after you've given yourselves to Jesus. He's, you're being made holy. But then there's this part for us. There's our part. We have some ways to respond to the things that God is doing. And it's these let us bits, right? Um, a lot of pastors in the past, I've heard them use like lettuce, like, like the vegetable. Like, I'm not doing that. Um, but let us draw near to God, having sincere hearts, full assurance. Full assurance, that's a hard one sometimes, right? Like being able to be so bold that we could approach God the Father and say, yeah, I'm here and I'm weak, and I kind of suck at this thing, and I'm broken, and I just send over here, and I really want to punch this person in the face right now. I used the, you know, it was like kicking a dog one time, and everyone's like, oh, you know, <laughs> I don't want to do that. But like, um, you know, it's like, you know, it, but so I recognize that having full assurance can be hard. Having full confidence that God is, is actually moving in our midst, Some, sometimes that's, that's hard. Because life, when it gets really challenging and difficult and we're sad and we're hurt and we're frustrated and we're angry, we don't, we, don't want us, we don't want sometimes to have the confidence that God is moving in our midst. We don't want to believe that he's doing something despite our circumstances. Because we often will put our circumstances above what faith wants us to see, like our faith wants, wants to do in, our, in us. Our faith is important as we follow Jesus. So I recognize that full assurance that, that's, that that can be a hard one. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we prof- profess, even when times are hard, even when we're sad, even when we have these seemingly hopeless moments. And then finally, let us consider how we can encourage one another to good deeds encouraging one another to do, to do good things, to, to minister to others, to, to meet the needs of the community around us. And we do this by continuing to meet together on Sundays, weekdays, lunch, dinner, whatever. We continue to meet together. So this, what we see here in Hebrews 10, there's, this is a great example of how there's God's part and then there's our part. Right? There, there's the things that God's doing that, that only God can do, or the things that only God was able to do, like a, a, a t- atoning for our sins. Like we, and then there's the, the ways that we respond, the ways that we encourage one another, the ways that we challenge one another, the ways that we uh, seek to understand and to allow our, to our faith to, to stretch and to grow and mature. So why are we talking about this? What, like, why, why today? Um, well, there's a word that has been rattling around in my head for about a month, and that's the word liturgy. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I, I confess, I don't know why, but I felt like there was just something to, I, just, I think there's something here for us to talk about. Um, so I have a question for you, and it's an actual question. Right? Someone's like actual answers. When you hear the word liturgy, what comes to mind? Reading from a book. Whoa, wait. What? Reading from a book. Reading from a book. 
okay? Like, like, like the, the Book of Common Prayer or something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Somebody else said something? Repetition. Repetition, yes. Mm-hmm. Repetition brings familiarity, right? High church. Say that? High church. High church, right. Can you explain what that means, briefly? <laughs> um, robes. Robes, mm-hmm. yep, yep. Big pulpits, like up here, yeah. yep. Incense. Incense, yep, yep, yep. Practice, yep. Steps. Steps. What do you mean by steps? Like steps. Step one, step two. Oh, okay. I'll think you meant like steps. Got it. Step one, step two. Got it. I do this, then I do this, then I do this. It leads to this. Anything else? Structure. Structure. Yes. Yeah, structure. That's what comes to my mind. I think about... Um, I think about, uh, sometimes for me, when I think about the word liturgy, I think about the flow, right? The flow of what we do on Sundays in particular. Um, here at NLCF in Generations, we have a flow. Like we, you might, you might have picked up on it by now. <laughs> and it's good, right? Repetition, familiarity. There's something beautiful about it. We, we come together and there's, everybody's talking. We have a first word which is like a call to worship. Then we sing. We we worship through song. Then we greet one another, our points of connection. We pray for the children as they go off into their lessons. We have a sermon. Then we take communion together. Then we sing. And then we have what we call our ways to respond that goes along with our blessing and our sending. This is our kind of normal flow that we have here in Generations. You, You almost know what to expect if you've been coming here for a while. Um, and when we mix it up, sometimes people don't like it. <laughs> I'm okay with that, you know. Like I'm okay, you know. It's um, but 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 that's you know that could be an example of like how we have a, we have like a, fl- a flow. We have a liturgy here in NLCF. But but what does liturgy have to do with what we're reading here in Hebrews 10? Uh, how does it relate even to what we started off with in Matthew 6 when Kinsey was reading it, or um, you know when we as a, as a congregation, we, we stand together and we recite the Lord's Prayer. Um, well, the liturgy, liturgy is our part. Liturgy is our response to the things that God is doing in our midst, or the things that he wants to do in our midst. Let me kind of explain that a little bit. Um, liturgy, it's a, we're stepping into like a little history lesson here, okay? So get your hearts ready. Um, so liturgy is a word, you won't find it in most of your Bibles. Um, it actually, so it comes from a Greek word uh, that refers to the task of the people. Um, and in most cases, like in that instant, it actually would kind of talk about the, the priests or the bishops. Like we, we kind of see this in Exodus. Uh, it's, it's found in the Septuagint which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So there's like some stuff that you might not care about. But, like, um, but, but the most direct translation for, the, for liturgy is the work of the people. I like that phrase. I like the phrase, the work of the people. It doesn't mean all the work that gets done. Because the, remember, there are things that God has done, that God is doing, that only God can do. But there's our part our part is that work of the people. I just, I, I, I like that phrase. Some of you are like, work, that's a four-letter word, and I don't want to hear it, you know. Um, but the work of the people. We see so many instances of this in the Old Testament, particularly in regards to, like, this, the inner workings of the tabernacle um, or the temple. Um, our, our small group, we just did, like, this, we were doing this podcast uh, called Bema, and we did, they did this blitz episode through Leviticus, and it talks about, which most of us, like, we get real excited about reading Leviticus, right? Um, but, but there's this beautiful description of, like, what does it mean to, like, engage with God? God cares about the details. He really, really does. But it was this, there was this place where God and his people they were really able to work out their relationship. Good things happened there. Things um, that were done, they were done a certain way, um, very carefully done, in an effort to help 
God's people uh, be, be worthy of, of the calling that they had received to be God's people. He was, he was building their relationship in a very specific way. There's a lot more I could go into about that. But I kind of don't want to, I don't have time for that this morning. But, but in the New Testament, we see some examples of this as well. Um, we, we see glimpses of liturgy being lived out. When Jesus, um, some of these are like, you know, when Jesus, he gives his disciples a way to pray. That's what the Lord's Prayer is. From, there from Matthew 6. Uh, he was explaining to them this. He said, in, basically he was saying, in moments when you don't know what to pray, here's what you can pray. Uh, these words will aid you in your understanding of who I am, who the Father is, and, and what the inner workings of the kingdom look like. like. If you really take time and you just kind of reflect on that, that prayer, it is pretty amazing stuff. And it's challenging too. Forgive others. Like, I mean, this is like a big deal, right? You know? Um, now, it, it, in Jesus' time, uh, that's weird to say. Because Jesus is like, this is his time too, I guess. But like, uh, so when Jesus was walking on earth, right? Okay, 2,000 some years ago. Um, just like, get real specific here. Um, so it was a normal thing for a rabbi to have specific prayers that he would give his disciples. And they would pray. It was kind of like um, them being connected to the rabbi, but the rabbi really trying to help them to understand uh, their understanding of, of, of who God was and what it meant to be God's people. And so they would often say, hey, when you pray, pray this way. And so G when Jesus' disciples come up to him and say, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? He's like, here, here you go. Like that's, that's what he was doing. That it was um, f for them and for Jesus, it was a way for them reaffirming their followership of Jesus. That's what that was. At the Last Supper, uh, we see this, this thing that Jesus introduces, this way of worshiping. He, he, he holds up a loaf of bread and a cup, and he, he, he explains it. He said, this is what this represents, and this is what this represents, and it is a good thing. And when you get together, would you, and you do this, would you remember me? He was instituting a, a liturgy in their lives. It must have stuck because here we are, some 2,024 years ago. After, like, we're still doing it. 2024, y'all. That's weird. Um, but the call to not give up meeting together, people gathering regularly to hear teachings, people sharing what they have, committing themselves to the apostles' teaching, the stuff that we read about in Acts chapter 2, is also part of that liturgy that we see in the New Testament. In many churches, both today and for centuries, liturgy has consisted of some very specific things done in very specific ways at specific times. Invited to stand up, say this, do this, sit down, pray this way. If you didn't grow up in a church that had a specific focus on some of these types of liturgy, when you see them, you're like, that's weird. I'm tired of sitting down and standing up. Can I stop doing that? I'm just going to opt out. Like it just, it's not your normal thing. And you're like, I'm, my legs hurt. You know, it can feel foreign, foreign to us. And maybe even unnecessary. Maybe it even might even feel to you overdone. But the actions that are taken, they can have a beauty in themselves because they are meant to represent something about the kingdom. They're meant to represent something about our understanding of who God is of the work of Jesus. Um, watch of anybody who's Catholic take communion and just see them, watch, watch their hands. It's like they can't not do, like they, yeah. It is beautiful, to, and I'm not picking on Catholics. What I'm saying is that there is beauty in the motions. Legitimately, I mean that. Like there's beauty in the motions, and there's a purpose for it because it's meant to help you remember who God is. Now, this isn't some like surprise of like, hey, we're going to do things different here in NLCF. That's not why I'm here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some of y'all are like, what's about to happen? Nothing, nothing like that, I promise. Um, we're not going to start doing things looking a different way. My aim here 
is to take just like this super brief look at this rich history that the church has. Um, and for us to be able to get a sense of what it looks like for us to be people who are responding to the things that God has done so that we might be able to prepare our hearts for how God is going to move tomorrow. Let me say that again. The aim for this is that we might have an understanding of the rich history in the church to understand how it is that God has been moving so that we can understand how it is that we can respond to what he's doing now and in the future. I I recognize I said that two different ways, and that's fine. But this is what really, really what liturgy is all about. Today, what today has been, has been a, uh, a glimpse of where we've come from, of what, what kind of goes on, and, and, and there's a lot that I missed, uh, and a, a lot that we could get into and all that sort of stuff. But the hope was that we get a glimpse of what, um, what it is and why it is that, 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 that liturgy means, even for, if it's just a super brief snapshot. Because next week, so we're 50% of the way through this series right now. <laughs> next week, we're going to take some time to understand what does it look like for us to live a life of liturgy, to have life as liturgy? Um, what does it look like for us to do this personally? What does it look like for us to do this as a body of believers? That's what we're going to talk about next Sunday. <laughs> so I hate to do like the cliffhanger thing, like, oh, come back next Sunday. But I recognize that I'm kind of doing that. Um, but the purpose for today was just to introduce this idea. And so now I'd like to take a moment and pray. But before that, here, here, let me, yeah, sorry, tricked you. Um, I wanna, there's this question for us to think about. And it's this. It's, uh, when you think of the phrase, life as liturgy, what comes to mind. I'm not asking you to answer this right now. But this is something to think about this week, to reflect on. Because this is the stuff that we're going to talk about next Sunday. So, would you pray with me? Jesus, you are in our midst. You are here. And you are working. You see us and you hold us. We honor you, and we want to glorify you with our lives, with the things that we do, and with who we are. We want to to live a life in confidence, um, holding just unswervingly to this hope that we have that you uh, are good, that you are moving. God, there is so much that you have done that we simply are unable to do. Sometimes we've called it, referred to it as you've, you've done the heavy lifting. It's not up to me as a pastor to, to do the rest of the lifting for, for anyone in this room except for myself. Um, each one of us as a person, um, you, you long for us to have hearts that are responding to what you're doing, that move with you, that step into the things that you invite us into, things that can be, um, that they feel so natural because you have gifted us in a very specific way to do certain things for the sake of the kingdom. But then there's also things that are so difficult that we can't imagine stepping into them that we don't want to step into. But yet you still invite us into that. With that stuff, I pray for strength. Pray for guidance. Uh, we're going to might walk out of this room here this morning and step into a super difficult situation. or we might step into something that feels so natural. Either way, Jesus, we want to be able to honor you with our lives. So in this moment, here, this morning, we lift you up. 
We honor you. We glorify you. We thank you for the work that you have done that we cannot do ourselves. Jesus, we thank you that you are this priest that has made this sacrifice once and for all. Guide us as we seek to live a life that you invite us into. We love you. We pray this in your name. Amen.